So good morning, good afternoon here from Italy, Ateneum Pontificio Regina Apostolorum, European University of Rome. I'm Professor Alberto Carrara, Director of the Neurobiotics Research Group. And uh, today we are a special guest, a friend of mine, a great neurosurgery and also a psychiatrist, Professor Robert Buchanan. First of all, I want to introduce our topic uh, to this year we focus on, we deal with neurotechnologies in our School of Bioethics and in the UNESCO Chair in Bioethics and Human Rights and in the Science and Faith Institute at the Ateneo Pontificio Regina Apostolorum and also in the European University of Rome. Our project and our goals for this year, 2021-2022, is um, inspired by our recent achievement made in the field of neurotechnologies. We want to dedicate this year of formation and also research to the critical analysis. This is the point, the critical analysis of the emerging scenario relating to the progressive human technology hybridization from the development of electroencephalography to those of, uh, for example, magnetic resonance and from the brain computer interfaces up to the so-called mind reading um, uh, till the so-called cybernetic telepathy. Mark Zuckerberg spoke about um, this type of telepathy, cybernetic telepathy of a sort of mind reading. Uh, this solicitation of, from robotics, the development of artificial intelligence, uh, and also of the multiple application of human, human enhancement, um, challenging our human nature and also the concept of person and personhood, I guess. Uh, so this multiple application of human enhancement challenged challenge our man and human of today, uh, call to know in order to decide with awareness, the direction to be given to neurotechnological progress. So this first, the, this is the fifth um, program that we had here. Uh, in Rome, but also in, uh, in the world, because our uh, neurobioactive research group is like international from Italy to United States, to Canada, to Mexico, to Colombia, uh, also to Brazil, Spain, United Kingdom, Germany, etc. And so we want to collect our fruit of this interdisciplinary research and reflection and offer to you uh, um, this uh, going deeper, deeper and deeper in the, this frontier of neurotechnology. And uh, so now I want to present to you our speaker of today. We start last uh, September 24th um, with uh, Professor Jesus La Fuente. Now we have Professor Robert Buchanan. I introduce br br briefly Professor Robert Buchanan now, and I'm go deep to his specialties. He's both a neurosurgeon and a psychiatrist, chief on neurosurgery at Seton Brain and Spine Institute, Cito Family Hosp of Hospital, also director of this center, director of epilepsy surgery and deep brain stimulation at Seton Brain and Spine Institute, associate professor uh, at the University of Texas, United States, of course, and a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life. And um, Professor Buchanan um, specializes, he, he is a neurosurgeon and a fellowship trained epilepsy neurosurgeon. He completed his epilepsy surgery fellowship at Yale University, I guess it's very important, under the mentorship of Dr. Dennis Spencer. 
He is the chief of functional and restorative neurosurgery and neurosciences at the Seton Brain and Spine Institute. And he completed both neurosurgery and psychiatry residency at the University of California, San Diego. He then went on to a postdoctoral research fellowship at the Salk Institute in Loyola, California, in laboratory in the laboratory of Dr. Rusty Cage. He is Associate Professor of Psychology and Neurosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. And his laboratory is at the University of Texas at Austin, and he conducts research on the causes and treat treatments of ep epilepsy. In his lab, Dr. Buchanan and his research team use for example, image-guided transcranial magnetic stimulation to study brain function in both health and disease people. His team also works with patients implanted with electrodes to use their brain recording, so the so-called brain-computer interface, and MRI to help better define the seizure focus. Dr. Buchanan performed all types of epilepsy surgery and sees patients from all around the country. So I very interested in hearing from you, Professor Buchanan. Uh, may I uh, start with uh, some uh, insight because nowadays uh, our researcher, researchers start from, for example, the cinematography movies for example, that portrayed neurosurgery, neuroscience, and the interface between uh, substances, technology implanted in our uh, brain or in our um, nervous systems. And so from these neuro movies, we move to the reality, for example, of ne Neuralink, Elon Musk that portrayed in two different ex experiments, 2020 and 2021, uh, this sort of micro mm, brain computer interface in animals. But last, last time I said that this is new, this is not new stuff because brain computer interfaces start long de de decades ago. No? We've, for example, I know the lab uh, of, uh, um, um, for example, um, um, the, the man um, who did one of the first brain computer interface in uh, Pittsburgh with Jan Sherman, these women with uh, neurodegenerative disorders in 2004. So this is not new stuff. This, I guess, in Neuralink, the point is making this technology available for everybody. So from this type of scenario, yeah, <laughs> I know, uh, I want to give <laughs> to you the floor, Professor Buchanan, and thank you, thank you very much for uh, being with us, uh, with, with this technology, we connect Italy to United States <laughs> with Texas. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Father, that was... Uh very uh, comprehensive introduction. Um, I seem to look better in those pictures. I seem to have aged considerably and those pictures were just, just uh, not that long ago. It's amazing how I've aged, but um, I agree with everything you said. Um, what I wanted to accomplish today in the, in the lecture was to kind of take a whirlwind tour of what's going on in the technologies that are beginning to be thought of and are already being done uh, in the human person, uh, and maybe the challenges that are present that not everybody will understand. And I think a lot of the people that think about these issues, especially those on the humanities side, uh, may think that we're further along, <coughs> excuse me, with understanding brain function, then we really are. Uh, and it's gonna be the responsibility of you know, the, the global community to try to rein back or to slow down uh, some of the physicians, scientists that are 
trying to race towards the, uh, you know, the first permanent implant for not only the treatment of disease, but also the uh, enhancement of brain and mind function. I think we should try to figure out what consciousness is first, and we should try to figure out what the mind is. And before we start trying to modify those things, they're very modifiable, but uh, I think we need a better quantitative neurophysiological sense of where these things, these emergent properties sit. Let's see if I can share my screen. And I can. Voila. All right. Let's see. Heard enough about me. Um, kind of a funny statement, but um, you know, I've, I, I'm asked the question, I, you know, our brains uh, are, are pretty big and uh, is there redundancy in the brain? And do we only use 10% 10, 10 of our brain? I'm sure you've met people in your lives that you think use only 1% of their brain, but that's a whole other lecture. Um, but what is concerning is, is that I'm not sure about the answer to that question, but I would say that neuroscience is just beginning to unravel the, uh, the interconnectedness of the brain. Uh, all things in the brain are connected to another thing. You can get to every area in the brain by stimulating an area in the brain. You can get off to the other side. Uh, it would take a while, but I think that's the, the take home message about neuroscience, unbelievably complicated. Um, and uh, people need to be very, very careful and do ethical things to patients and to subjects uh, with more information than we currently have. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I have uh, you know, funding for the lab, NIH, as well as uh, industry grants. I'm currently the, the uh, principal investigator for uh, an international trial for placing deep brain stimulating electrodes in the brain to try to slow down and abate, decrease some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So we're in the pivotal stage of that trial now. I don't think Italy is a site. Um, you know, some of these, I've given this lecture, this was, I gave this lecture uh, at the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas where I'm a faculty member and it was the most highly uh, attended lecture in the history of the Dell Medical School, which is a, a young medical school. But people are very interested in this topic of cognitive enhancement. Um, when we go to neuroscience meetings, uh, all of the scientists, whether they're very basic scientists working on non-human mammals or fruit flies, whatever their substrate is to study brain, central nervous system function, they're all talking about the next steps to enhance uh, the human uh, brain and mind. So uh, this is something that uh, Father Alberto and I have also talked about that uh, we hope that too, that the Holy See, uh, and, you know, maybe with our help could get in front of this issue a little bit because it's a buzz and uh, uh, we really need to think about this very closely. Now, you probably have had lectures uh, by people that are certainly more uh, qualified than I about the definition of the human person. But I think uh, one of the uh, issues that uh, not everybody shares is, you know, what are the goals of our human existence? And the other thing that I'm concerned about, even though I think both uh, St. Thomas and uh, St. Augustine felt that man was essentially good you know, we have a hard time finding that in, uh, in the, uh, the annals of human history. So, you know, in the, so there are other market factors that also drive discovery, especially as it relates to uh, interfacing a technology with a human. And that, are, and that is the uh, medical device industry, the medical uh, medications and psychotropic medications, 
these companies, which are multi-billion dollar companies, also drive uh, science, fortunately, unfortunately, I have money from them as well, in certain directions. And if the physician scientists aren't careful, they can be driven in certain directions. And 1% uh, of the population has schizophrenia worldwide. Pretty soon, 8%, 10%, 15% as the population ages is going to have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so there is a real push to study Alzheimer's disease medic med with medications, with devices like putting deep brain stimulators in. But the companies want, they, they need a payoff and they you know, they want the results quick, but they, these are the kind of results that we can't give them quick. Now, treating disease is one thing, and the, the, the fine line between what's a disease and what's enhancement that's also been discussed by um, multiple ethicists over the years, especially as it relates to brain-based diseases. There are a lot of terms that are used and are uh, by both lay people and uh, people within the fields that we haven't really been able to quantitate, like IQ. We, IQ is a, is a very loose term. You talk to four neuropsychologists about how to define IQ, and they'll give you 10 different answers. Mood, mood is another uh, thing that, I mean, I'm also, I'm, a, I'm the only boarded, uh, board certified psychiatrist and board certified neurosurgeon in the United States. And uh, I would like uh, to have biomarkers to define mood and anxiety and, and not just semantics, uh, which can be uh, manipulated and the meanings of the, of the language is very important. Uh, so uh, that's a problem. And so when you're enhancing cognition, what, what are you enhancing? There are some things like a, uh, memory for persons, places, and things. Well, we can kind of agree on that or memory for uh, certain skills or procedures that we learn, which are two memory systems in the brain that I, that I study. Um, but these are the questions that a physician scientist need to ask themselves. I would, would I wanna take this drug? Would I want this, this uh, device being placed in my brain? So I'm gonna just skip over some of the slides too to allow for questions if people have questions too, because I think it should conjure up a lot of questions. But you know, this lecture has really nothing to do with uh, equity or uh, the proper worldwide distribution of these devices if ever they come to market or, or medications or pills, because we know even here in the United States and other first world countries in Western Europe too, not everything is equal, you know, and people get better health care than other people. So who's going to get the magic pill to make uh, you know, as smart as Albert Einstein. I think we know who's going to get it initially will be the, you know, the wealthiest and best connected within a society. So I don't know if in Europe you know who Chicken Little is, but Chicken Little was a, a uh, worried about everything and the smallest problem, he would run around saying the sky is falling. And I'm not really Chicken Little, uh, but, you know, this lecture does... Uh, you know, we are tampering with the essence of who we are. This isn't just a knee replacement or something with our intestines. I mean, this is the, the seat of who we are and whether you're a humanist or whether you're a person of faith, um, the seat of the soul, the seat of the person is what is being manipulated here. So we have to be very, very careful. There's been many, many books that have been written. There's more books written about uh, psychosurgery Back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, there was a Nobel Prize won by Dr. Monitz uh, for doing frontal lobotomies. He didn't do the frontal lobotomy. It was done by a neurosurgeon that he worked with. Um, but more books written about that than about the Vietnam War, which was a disaster uh, for the United States and Vietnam alike. Uh, and there have been people, I, you know, this guy, uh, Jose Delgado, was a a Spanish trained neurosurgeon, uh, and he wrote a book. This is a book. I mean, I don't know if you have this book, Father, but I'll, I'll send you a copy. It's 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 frightening. Uh, you see right there, toward a psycho civilized society. So, by whose standards? Uh, 
Catholic standards, Lutheran standards, Maoist standards. So the standard would have to be defined. And it, it, we're nowhere near doing that. Uh, but uh, this is the direction people are thinking. You know, they're thinking, uh, is, this a, is this part of the mind of God that uh, we're now stumbling across all these things and natural selection and the normal processes of evolution have occurred at a very slow rate. But now, because we're figuring things out, we will accelerate evolution in, in a way, sort of neuronal or central nervous system evolution by interfacing things. Well, we interface our phones with, uh, with, our, with ourselves, or we wear eyeglasses, which is an enhancement. But uh, changing the way our brain is firing is uh, very different, very different than wearing eyeglasses. This is Walter Freeman, uh, who was a neurologist uh, who uh, decided he was going to do frontal lobotomies in the office. He initially worked with a Dr. Freeman, who, uh, or uh, what's his name? I can't think of his name. The neurosurgeon, they shared office space. <clears throat> and the neurosurgeon would do you know, traditional frontal lobotomies um, and the patient would be apathetic and uh, they wouldn't worry about anything but certainly had changed their, their personality, their, their motivations. And, uh, but that was cumbersome, what uh, Dr. Freeman thought. And so one day the neurosurgeon walked into their suite of offices that they shared. And Dr. Freeman had a patient leaning backwards in the office and had an ice pick underneath the, uh, or the top of the orbit, which is a very thin part of the skull. And he was taking an ice pick and moving it back and forth like a windshield wiper. And the neurosurgeon was horrified and stormed out of the office and they never spoke again. And then he became eventually more of a pariah than an outcast because a psychotropic medication was discovered sort of coincident with this. They were able to give what are classically called sort of heavy sedatives, but they are the uh, medications that were used to treat schizophrenia and other things. And uh, he, would, he went in his Winnebago where he could do frontal lobotomies with his ice pick, or he would travel sort of uh, psychiatric hospitals that were out in the, uh, in the country. Um, so so uh, I, just a little interlude, that's me. When I was in third grade, I won the won the science fair in Chicago. I grew up in Chicago, went to the University of Chicago. It was a pretty good project, it looks like. I don't know, I probably was doing better back then. So um, yeah, this is of, of interest. And um, you know, these are two people that have written about, uh, and I would agree the, with both of these guys. And you know, I, I would also make the case uh, against what would be called uh, perfection as well. And I know I've, Father Alberto just loves, I brought this up years ago and he uses it all the time now, but it's true. So, you know, around this topic and around all these topics now, um, the, the scientist needs to communicate with the, you, you know, the person in the humanities. And, uh, you know, C.P. Snow was just horrified walking into the uh, lunchroom one day uh, where this, the, the mathematicians couldn't even talk to the scientists, couldn't talk to the philosophers, couldn't talk, you know, to the, to the biochemists. So it was just, it was a ridiculous, and they all looked down on each other because they lack knowledge. So I think that uh, that was something that Father Roberto and I talked about, even in the Pontifical Academy, that we, we have all these people from disparate and different training, and we have to come to, to grips and understand a language that we can get our message across. Um, you guys know all about, I would imagine, classic bioethical theories. I don't need to go into metaphysics, that's for sure. Father Alberto has, has six or seven PhDs by now. Um, so, I mean, he's got a PhD in about everything you can imagine. Um, but, you know, how to, how to view technology. And uh, Dr. Latvovic, uh, was a uh, somebody here from the states was a pretty good thinker. Unfortunately, he died early. He died suddenly, but he came. He came up with uh, ten different ways, uh, consistent with moral Catholic moral tradition, how one could look at technology. 
you know, and, and you can see each of those. I mean, I would say that initially it turns into a, I mean, the way I would view it is a neutral tool that, uh, you know, uh, that has to be proven to be something that will be uh, certainly used for good. And if it can't be used for good, it should be discarded. And everything is a gift from God, I would say. So, but this, if you're interested in uh, a formulation of uh, technology in a Catholic, a Catholic context, I would uh, direct you to a, a number of the papers that uh, this guy had written before his untimely death. So when I think about this, I always worry, and you can see the Terminator, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, down in the, the right-hand side, but there is this, uh, I think to make people healthy, to make people live uh, what they see as a full life, uh, trying to wipe out as much disease and suffering as we can, and there's always gonna be disease in an imperfect world, uh, but we, we've done pretty well. Uh, lifespan has increased, um, the amount of suffering in many parts of the world uh, have been improved. But uh, what we've gone to now is that human beings feel that they're, uh, you know, the ghost in the machine. You know, we are bound by this, uh, by this shell, which is fallible, sick, which ends up dying, and we have to overcome um, our bodies all the way to people talking about downloading our minds or consciousness onto a computer. I mean, it's really quite scary. Um, so what is the purpose of life? You know, that's, uh, religions have helped answer that question. Different philosophies have answered that question. And uh, why, do we, why do we study biology? Why do we practice medicine? And um, you know, it's uh, certainly for the betterment of the world, and, uh, but to a point, I think. Um, so I think human beings are compelled to build a better mousetrap. They're always looking to find out something new. And then once they find out something new, they want to make that new thing better. And I, I say this tongue in cheek that human beings would never use technology initially created for a good purpose for an evil purpose. So I just want, you know, we don't want to be modern day Luddites. Uh, that's for sure. But, you know, just watching the, the, the evolution of culture and society from hunter gatherers to villages and sanitation and medicine. And then we figured out that bacteria causes viruses to infectious disease, but then man decides that they're gonna use, they could harness these infectious agents and they create biological warfare. And then the steam engine, you know, we had the industrial revolution, but tanks are, tanks are created, crematoria are created. And then where I went to school, we split the atom, but then it wasn't only used for power or to sort of understand the makeup of the universe. People drop, drop bombs. Computer, I mean, neat, uh, deep blue beats the great chess champion, but now we're engaged in cyber warfare with the possibility of turning off a grid of a whole country, uh, which would be turning off ventilators and other things that people need to maintain their life. And so then you think, well, uh, we want to create uh, a better body, a better brain, a better mind uh, that would all be good, but uh, could it evolve into, you know, a dystopian novel that we're familiar with a couple of them and we'd have these human cyborgs uh, that would uh, be impervious to uh, feeling pain or emotion. And, uh, uh, you know, that uh, I think it's a possibility. I think that this is what human beings do. And I just put this up. This is a cartoonist from the United States. I don't know. He doesn't seem to publish these anymore, but this is mad scientist block, you know. I think I want to put a gorilla brain and a cow's head or, you know. And so, Sometimes scientists think this way. You know, they think uh, you have to get funding and grants and they want to win the Nobel Prize. But we certainly have to stay within our lane ethically. And then we're familiar with, you know, uh, Huxley and Orwell were well ahead of their time thinking about these issues. 
And if you think about these, you know, these two different, <laughs> I put earth in there as well, but these two different dystopias, the people, the, the citizen, uh, citizenry in the brave new world, they were actually happy. They were engineered. They could get soma when they weren't feeling so well. And they had as much of what they wanted because uh, they didn't really know any better. But the people in 1984, which I think would be us, uh, were miserable. They were miserable in a gray world. Uh, that was, uh, that was uh, not something we want. Um, it was the Nigerian ambassador, Holy See, and my son's godfather on my left-hand side. So, Cavalieri di Malta. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I, again, you guys have probably talked about this, but this, you know, the human person is at the center of this, the center of this discussion. And, you know, how, how do you define a human person? You ask a scientist how they would define a human person. Uh, if the scientist is, uh, their life is not based in faith, um, it would be a different, a different answer. I would answer the question with some of these things as well. I mean, I think, you know, the, what makes us human, the number one is that we're created by, by a God who's created us in his image and likeness. But I mean, our, our genotype leads to our phenotype, and then we have behavioral characteristics as well. And um, I think that the, uh, you know, it always has to come back to this, but I, I think many of the humanists uh, also agree with most of this, but I, they're always on shaky ground when they try to decide whether or not a characteristic should be modified or not. Um, you know about all of this. There's always been a fascination between other people in the scientific community, other people often, and people who are philosophers of mind, and the neurosurgeon. Um, the, the kind of neurosurgery that I do, I have very little interest in it, other types of neurosurgery. I was I, went, I did my psychiatry residency first, and then I did a National Institute of Health uh, Psychobiology Psychopharmacology Fellowship, where I ran a research unit, and then I then I came back and did neurosurgery and then the fellowship. But um, most neurosurgeons uh, don't understand much of the micro architecture and micro functioning of the brain. So Dr. Cushing, who's considered to be the father, certainly of American neurosurgery and had many innovations. He's wearing a light bulb on his head there to get better visibility, but the great uh, psychologist Pavlov, physiologist, psychologist, often went and watched Cushing operate. But Cushing was doing gross operations on a brain. He would take off bone and scalp and take out tumors and things like that. You don't learn much. The field that I'm in, and that's specifically why I did neurosurgery was to enter this field of functional neurosurgery. And I'll show you the, 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 the shortcoming as a functional neurosurgery as well. But we uh, modify function of the brain as opposed to destructive surgery. Neurosurgeons are destructive surgeons. We don't really sew things together. We don't repair things. Some, some things can be repaired, but very few. Neurosurgeons suck things out. So if you have some problem in your spine, they take out a disc, a spinal disc. If you have a brain tumor, we suck the brain tumor out. We clip the aneurysm. That's what neurosurgeons do. The functional neurosurgeon uh, applies uh, electricity or other things into the nervous system to help these uh, sort of organic physiological disorders uh, that I'll explain in, in brief to you moving forward. But Dr. Pavlov thought he was gonna learn something from Dr. Cushing by looking at the, the gross structure of the pathological human brain in the operating room. And I don't think it probably didn't learn very much. So are we our brain? I'm not so sure. Um, so the things that, the functions of the, the human brain, mind, and then ultimately the person, that I think are at risk of being modified with coming back and applying some kind of chemical, which could be neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, 
uh, applying um, medications directly to the brain, to the brain milieu, and I'll show you how that's done. I've written a number of papers about this stuff. Uh, or electricity will definitely modify one's free will and because uh, everything, everything is uh, in the same mix. It's all in the same stew, whether it's memory, whether it's certain levels of anticipation, anxiety, uh, all these things uh, go into making a decision to do this or that. If you're modifying uh, the memory systems, which are connected to every other system, there will be a modification of the person's sense of agency and how they're gonna make decisions. We already know that. And so that's something that uh, we've become very interested in in my group. Uh, there's, there's, there's some literature in the, the scientific literature and the medical literature that says even a patient who has deep brain stimulation for their Parkinson's disease, which works very well for the motor movement symptoms, their, their rigidity and tightness gets better, they can move faster, their tremor is less. Most of these patients can't describe it, but they feel different. So it has modified their sense of self, sort of where they sit in, in society, where they sit, they used to be here, and now there's somebody else, but it's very subtle, but they can't, so we don't have tools to measure this right now. Now those electrodes for Parkinson's disease go in in a very particular place, but as I said, everything is connected to everything in the brain. And we're pumping huge amounts of electricity, current into the brain with these procedures and the treatments. The quantity of these currents is like nothing the nervous system has ever experienced. You know, and then the, if there's an engineer listening or somebody who understands these things, but the the, the, uh, the way that the current is delivered is it's at uh, amplitudes that are far exceed anything the nervous system understands at rates that the nervous system can't keep up with, uh, but it does something. And the, I think the, the, the real gist of that is if you ask an, a movement disorder neurologist, a functional neurosurgeon, and a scientist who studies Parkinson's disease, and then you say, how does deep brain stimulation work to abate or decrease the symptoms of Parkinson's disease? There's not a consensus. And that is the, the thing that I think is another take home message about medicine. If, if biomedicine waited to have every answer to every question about a disease and about a treatment before they would apply it to, to a patient, to us, we take forever. So the way things come to market or the way things are distributed to patients is first and foremost, is it safe? Does it make things worse or something else worse? Number two, did it work? And here are the Parkinson's question. It does work, but you talk to five people who are in the field and they say, well, it's because it's stimulating things. And then you talk to another five people in the field and they say, no, it's inhibiting things. <clears throat> and it's almost comical, but we know it works and it's safe. So that's how biomedicine is done. So what we have to avoid is the same standard when we kind of decide that we're, we want to improve IQ or we want to wipe out memories or we want you know, we want to uh, make processing speed faster or increase our memory capacity by great, uh, by, you know, gigabytes. We can't use that standard of trying to alleviate disease because it's safe and it seems to do it, but not know why, because the long-term ramifications are gonna be dangerous. Um, so this is another, you know, treatment or enhancement. This is an issue that people talk about. Where does it, you know, what is normal? I mean, we have statistics that tell us that, you know, so the people that sit under the large part 
of the, uh, the bell-shaped curve, you're normal, you know? And then if you're on this side, you're, uh, you know, a little, you have some challenges. And if the, you sit on this side, you have some abilities that other people don't have. But how does society define that? And each, each society, each culture, governments could define that differently. We know that. It's, I mean, it's, it's similar to the abortion question. You know, there's always a slippery slope. Unless there's an absolute answer, life begins here or normal is here. It's going to be really, really tough because the, you know, what we say, you know, the goalposts, in a, in a game, whether it's soccer or foot, you guys call it football, you know, if you keep moving the goal, goal posts and they're arbitrary, you know, we live in a, in a relativistic society, this can't be, uh, this can't have the same standard uh, because it, it could turn further into disaster. So, you know, uh, are you, is an IQ of 100 good or should everyone have an IQ of 150? Is that good? Um, should you be able to remember seven digits or should you, everybody in the world should be able to enter that contest where they can remember, you know, 425 uh, parts of pi. You know, they recite these things and kids, uh, kids go to these competitions. 2020 vision. I see uh, father and I are both wearing glasses, you know, so we're not normal. We're, you know, we're weak. We have weak eyes. And then, I mean, even, even as far as physicality is concerned, is uh, Serena Williams, you know, the, probably the greatest female tennis player in the history of uh, the world. I mean, should that be the standard? Everybody should play tennis like Serena. Everybody should be as smart as Father Alberto. I mean, these are the, you know, so is this what we do? We have to, we, we aim for the stars. Um, so, you know, it's impossible to, to measure these. Now, <clears throat> let's see, I got some time left, but you know, how can you enhance? Well, people are already doing it and it's, uh, it's like a uh, buckshot of a gun, you know, it's shoots everywhere. So people take stimulant medications, which are basically amphetamine medications, causing the release and decreasing the uptake of uh, certain neurotransmitters, dopamine being the, the most, uh, the most talked about. Uh, so it's not, it's not specific. It's not specific to certain tracks or connectomes that people talk about, systems neuroscience. So the, if you, anybody who takes an amphetamine does better. You do better. Your concentration is up to a point. Your concentration is better. You're feeling up and ready to go, whether you have attention deficit disorder or not. If I took an amphetamine, uh, I would do better until I had to take more and more and more because the body, brain uh, develops a tolerance and then a dependence on the We do other things, you know, we, our lifestyle. Um, my son is now 14. He's never played a video game in his life. He's already written two books. Uh, he's got a great mother. You know, so, uh, uh, you know, so he's not attached to that. Uh, phone like so many kids are and so many adults are now but there's transcranial magnetic stimulation that uh, father alberto alluded to i have an image guided system and we're now using it to screen for other procedures um, and then there's this transcranial dermal cortical stimulation it's amazing to me that somebody it's basically a nine volt battery that you stick on your scalp and it cures what it ails you, you know? So it's amazing to me that that <laughs> causing current in the scalp, people think it's going to you know, cure things. And then the invasive technologies that I'm involved in, Elon Musk has just moved to uh, Austin. There's a number of uh, brain computer interface companies here now that we're, we're very involved with, but brain computer interface, and we're able to do cortical stimulation. We're able to do stimulation in deeper structures of the brain. Um, so these are the things that, you know, the, you know, I guess are those, are those benefits? I think what would happen is that the, the, the skills and the talents that are being valued by the society at any point in time would be how every child would be genetically engineered 
or every brain computer interface would be directed towards. So we'd have a bunch of STEM, you know, science and technology and engineering people running around, and we'd be left without poets and musicians. And uh, it sounds like a very boring society. Um, and then what are the unwanted changes? We don't know. We don't know what the unwanted changes are. Uh, but I, 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 I predict that they're greater than one would think because the nervous system also is very tricky. It always, it always does workarounds to problems and uh, we potentially could create monsters. And they said, and animal research doesn't predict what the frontal and prefrontal cortex is going to say about all of this current coming in. Uh, and that's, that's the bulk of our brains. Uh, this neocortex uh, that differentiates us from uh, lower animals. Um, and I think too, I think human instinct uh, can be seen as uh, dangerous. Uh, as I put here, has everybody got to be Einstein and as handsome as Brad Pitt, even though my wife said he's not very handsome, and then Serena Williams, everybody have to play tennis like her. Is that what you have to do? Already, we have parents that are in the United States, I don't know about Europe, that are crazy. They're sending their children to these preparatory courses to take the college entrance exams when they're in fourth and fifth grade to be trained because they wanna to go to Chicago or Harvard. Or, it's crazy. So you would imagine that uh, if there was a pill and if there was a, uh, that was FDA approved, make you smarter, or a, a machine that I could just drill a hole and just put it there, uh, they would all get it. Every, every child would get it, or they'd be genetically engineered, which is the scariest thing. Get it. And then we see it, you know, we see this tribalism, uh, uh, the other, there's always the other. You know, they're not what I am. I look this way, they look that way, I do this. And uh, humanity has never been able to get over that. And nothing really has changed. You look around the world. So how, do, how is that going to figure in? So it's, it's a scary prospect. You know, this, that she's all, she's hooked into the inter internet. She's all hooked in there. She doesn't look very happy, does she? I guess it's a she. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to, quickly tell you what, what uh, functional neurosurgery is. Everything is based on Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, and Z. And we have to have a firm base on the skull. And then we draw the X, Y, and Z coordinates. And then I'm able to get the point of whatever I want to my target based on those coordinates. And it's within sub-millimetric accuracy currently as we practice it. This was just a timeline of, you know, how things have evolved, but you know what? Um, his father also alluded to, I mean, if you read the lay press, it's almost like we're on the, we're on the verge of uh, some amazing, you know, the brain is now ours. We understand it. And we're just one little step away from uh, being able to completely harness the, uh, the potential of the brain. We're not. This is one of the reasons we're not. 85 billion neurons, and each of them has 100,000 connections. So this almost looks like what uh, President Biden is asking for, 10 quadrillion. That's his new budget um, uh, here in the United States. No, it's actually 3 trillion. I, I people talking about trillions of things. Uh, so here we are, you know, and this is a beautiful picture. There's a, a neuroscientist who makes these beautiful pictures. I, he gave me one of these. This is the hippocampus, which is the seat of memory uh, in the mammalian brain. Uh, but you would imagine, look at all of those connections. And look at all of those little, this, this web, this arachnoid looking web of all these connections. And we're going to stick a giant electrode in there and we're going to be able to subtly influence that. No, we're not. We're going to blast it into submission and destroy uh, some of the, some of the uh, connections. So what can be done now? I mean, we, we stimulate the cortex for epilepsy treatments. I've also stimulated the cortex to treat pain. 
We do deep brain stimulation for a number of different things. I've uh, put vectors, uh, these are viral vectors, and we put a gene in there when we were trying to help uh, people with Alzheimer's, this was years ago, it didn't work. Um, growth factor, we also tried to deliver, it didn't work. We can put drugs in the brain, directly into the brain, and uh, the problem is sort of pulsating it through the brain tissue without damaging it. And historically what we've done, I mean, neurosurgery, is we destroy things. As I told you, we suck things out, take tumors out, that kind of stuff. Now, everything that's being touted in human neuroscience, which is what people are interested in, is based on where the surgeon, the functional neurosurgeon, can go. So every patient that we see, whether they have Parkinson's or epilepsy or other movement disorders, psychiatric diseases, I also treat, we talk to them about possibly being involved in a research project. But I can't, I can't drill extra holes in the skull. I can't place electrodes where they really need to be placed. I place the electrodes only in places that are directed by the disease. So that limits, that limits what's been studied in human medicine. We only have electrophysiological measurements from some of these areas and just very small parts of these areas. So, so then to make a leap that we're going to now influence these areas in such a way that uh, uh, we're going to sort of change the essence of the, the human person. I think we will, but in a disastrous way. And the other thing to remember when you hear about these studies, and mine included, these patients all have a disease. Their brains don't work well. So patients with epilepsy, for instance, they have all kinds of issues with their brain. It could be all the way down to what are called channels where ions move in the neuron. So if that doesn't work right, then why would we think that other things would work exactly the way our brains who don't have epilepsy work. They don't, but people, that's the only thing we have to study though. I can't, people have actually studied normal people, but they've been like monsters. You know, there's, there's a, somebody here in the United States uh, that was, you know, giving people a stipend to allow them to put an electrode in their brain. You know, I mean, it's what people will do is crazy. Uh, we, are reasonably exacting where we can get electrodes, but it's not perfect. The human brain is very big. And the, the bigger things get, the, the error can be ever larger. So we use computer-based methodology along with the Cartesian coordinates and interoperative CAT scans to try to get electrodes and things where we want to get them. But it's still not perfect. And we put these huge electrodes in. And I just wanted to remind everybody, this is a picture of a deep structure in the brain called the thalamus. People always think of that homunculus over the top of the brain, you know, where there's a, a big thumb and big lips and a little this and a little that. Well, that principle is in the entire brain. So even the deep nuclei, like the thalamus, which is the great processor of the brain, probably where consciousness sort of sits some way, it also has a homunculus. The, 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 the body is represented. We get electrode recordings from the awake patient that we're operating on. In the olden days, they used to make holes in the brain. And guess what? It worked just as well as it, it putting the stimulators in. So that's why people think deep brain stimulation causes inhibition or destruction of function. Because if, in the olden days, they used to put hot probes in the brain and heat them up to coagulate or cook parts of the brain and destroy it. And that's what these holes are that you can see. I, you know, these are holes caused by heat. Uh, we still do this, by the way. Patients that don't have insurance and different things. I, I will still do this to try to help them. And then we used to take out huge parts of the brain. This is if, uh, this is if you're looking at me. You know, this is by one side of the brain. This isn't actually me. I mean, you probably think you have your cannon. Um, father was thinking that. But this is, they took out one side of the brain to treat the epilepsy. We try not to do this anymore, but believe it or not, this is still done for patients that have some terrible epilepsies. So neurosurgery was very primitive not so long ago, and we still do these things. You know, and this is, this is what I see when I do epilepsy surgery, and then I put electrodes on people's brains, and then I bring them out. 
And the patient goes for two weeks, a month, they spend in the hospital. And because I have all these electrodes, and I also put something called microdialysis catheters in where we can measure the milieu of the brain for neurotransmitters and things. And they have nothing to do but watch TV and wait to have seizures. That's what we do. We wait for them to have seizures. With all these electrodes in and on their brain. So we use that period of time to study the brain. But again, we're only studying the areas that were clinically indicated to study. I can't study the whole brain like I'd like to, like this, this, uh, this patient here. You know, she, she's not a mouse. You know, We also have to treat mice nice too. You know, this is just pictures from the operating room. Uh, for deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, we have to do our research within the operating room for the most part because the whole operation is done. Epilepsy patients go to the hospital, to the, to the epilepsy ward for days, weeks. Uh, but the Parkinson's patients, we have to do our research in a very artificial environment, especially if you're doing subtle memory testing or emotional testing is what we do. And this is very artificial, right? Being in the operating room, knowing you have a electrode in your heads. Dr. Buchanan just drilled a hole in your skull. You know, so they're really not themselves. So we, you know, it's hard to study subtle emotional or higher cognitive functions in this setting, but we do it. That's the only thing we can do. And my son, who's now 14, he used to eat brains. And I was always worried he was going to get mad cow disease, but he never got it. Um, so, so where does this leave us? You know, I've given us a few uh, sort of warnings. What we do in functional neurosurgery, which is really, it's a kind of a linchpin to moving some of these technologies forward, right? So, and a lot is made of what we find. So uh, one thing that was discovered by a colleague of mine, I know him very well, he also trained at Yale, uh, Itzhak Fried, his name is, he's an Israeli, uh, half of his time is spent at UCLA and half of his time is spent in Tel Aviv. And he, in his group described the, the Jennifer Aniston neuron, the Jennifer Aniston neuron. So every time they showed a patient, epilepsy patient who had electrodes in to study their epilepsy, every time they saw a picture of Jennifer Aniston, I guess who's some actress, um, the neuron would respond. And then they'd show a picture of some other blonde actress, the neuron wouldn't respond. And then they'd show a picture of Brad Pitt, who was her boyfriend at the time, neuron wouldn't respond. So they coined Jennifer Aniston neuron. But if you read the paper carefully, uh, they, don't, they don't describe what area of the hippocampus they're in. They don't say what subfield they're in. It was just good enough to say, we stuck an electrode, which was designed to measure general, general uh, physiology to define epilepsy. And there was kind of a jump to say, but that neuron was a Jennifer Aniston neuron. I, mean, I, I don't have a Jennifer Aniston neuron, so I, nothing would fire in my brain. I didn't know who she was until I read the paper. But if you look at these papers that have come out, um, different groups, it appears they're doing the exact same thing to similar areas of the brain, and they're getting exact opposite results. So they, they, they stimulate a part of the temporal lobe and memory's better. And then another group writes a paper. We, st we stimulated uh, and the memory was worse. So you know, it's, it's good that we're able to do these experiments, but not too much should be made of it. Now, Elon Musk, now he's, he's just moved to town. So he's my neighbor. And he's my neighbor with a lot of money. You know, so we, uh, what is he? The richest man in the world, is he? Close to it. So, you know, what is the chief of neurosurgery who's a functional neurosurgeon? Who does he want to know? He wants to know the richest man in the world who is also interested in brain function. Now, Elon is less interested in brain function as opposed to being a technology maven, a technology guru. That's what he is. He, he's a genius and he thinks outside the box. So that's what they're doing at, Neuralink, they are designing a robot that's much better than my hand. I mean, the robot doesn't wear a bow tie, so that's one of the that's one of the, uh, the drawbacks. But is able to put in electrodes into a pig or primate brain, non-human primate, that are that are finer than 
a human hair. So, and if I did it, you know, it'd be tough. And they're designing these electrodes that on one hair, uh, thick electrode, they can put a thousand contacts as opposed to the one contact that we presently work with. So he's coming up with some good ideas, but you know what? We don't know what to do with a thousand contacts in the human brain. And he then wants to create these arrays. So you'll have a thousand electrodes with a thousand contacts. So, but we don't know what to do with that. And then if you put that in, there's a lot of density there and you're gonna destroy parts of the brain. I think I have pictures of that kind of stuff. Um, this is just transcranial magnetic stimulation. So here's what we put in now. I just wanted to give you a sense. You saw that beautiful picture, the colored picture of the hippocampus uh, with all of these connections. And this is what we put in the brain. Look at the size of these things. So the scale, so when, when as, as, a, as a physician scientist, when I go to the scientific meetings and I show a picture like this to scientists who do uh, guinea pig or rat physiology, they look at this and they look in horror. You know, you put something that big in the human brain uh, because the company is making it. You know, I have other things, and this is something we've designed with these little teeny, these are, you know, filamentous to get single neuron recordings, but it's still huge. It's still huge. Um, but this is what we're working with. And then I also, I, I take measurements of chemistry, depending. I, we've sort of slowed that down a little bit, but that's another thing that I'm trying to understand. The other thing that's sort of lost in this conversation is the brain is chemical and electrical, right? And so one does not go without the other. And if you just, you just beat it up with electricity, you have to make these chemicals. The brain makes chemicals that it takes a while to make. So the brain can't catch up to make these chemicals. So you, you, you create this artificial milieu. Um, this is the study we're doing for Alzheimer's disease. A very scary place to put an electrode, but so far so good. It's at the center of the brain in front of something called the fornix. So here's just some pictures. And you know, this is what they use now, Utah array, Michigan array. This is used, and this, this is easier to make sense of than cognitive enhancement. But you know, when you take the part of the brain, it's complicated again, but the part of the brain that I decide I'm going to do this with my finger, there's an area in my brain right about here that's moving and it's, it's firing away. I have, through my free will, activated it and try to figure that one out. That's, uh, that's one for the ages. So you know, where did that energy come from that all of a sudden I decide to move my finger? But so if you put this electrode array on there, you might be able to stimulate it in a crude fashion where the paralyzed person might be able to move. And, they, and we found that they do that. It's not a fine fluid movement, but it's a start. And these are the electrodes that we place on the brain when we study epilepsy. These are huge too. Here's somebody's finger, right? So these are huge electrodes. You can imagine there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of nerve cells, neurons below that electrode. And that's the technology we currently have. And this is, so that size, it scales. But this is what happened when you put these electrodes in the brain, you cause holes because they're rigid. And then the brain moves. Every heartbeat that you have, the brain pulsates like this. I can see it in the operating room when we're operating. The brain will move. So if you got something rigid in the brain, like a bed of nails, the brain moves and it tears and creates inflammation and destroys the brain there. And so the electrode stops working because it gets encapsulated and covered by the brain wants to shut it off. And so you can't get good signals from it anymore. So many engineers and others are trying to figure out, like Elon, and a very flexible that it would just move with the, with the pulsations of the brain. So you can deliver chemicals to the brain. We, we measure with this. Just to give you an idea, so vagal nerve stimulation, the nerve in your neck comes from your brain. The minute they could make it, it was good for everything. It's good for epilepsy. It's good for depression. It's good for, if you're fat, if you're skinny, I mean, whatever it is, it will, it will cure you. It became like snake oil. And this is the problem, the snake oil salesman, they, you know, they tell you whatever you want. Uh, this is the problem with these technologies. We also stimulate the spinal cord and we're doing a study on this right now, um, which is a very interesting study, by the way, because 
my the psychiatrist is my hypothesis that in many patients, spinal cord stimulation for pain, that's what it's used for, it helps with pain. I don't think it has anything to do with the spinal cord. Spinal cord connects to the, the brain and your skull. And I think it's creating some cognitive changes that we're trying to tease out. Uh, pain is, what is pain? Pain is an interpretation. So uh, we also stimulate that too. And people have had not as bad as deep brain stimulation, but sort of sense that uh, something else is going on with me. I, I can't put my finger on it. So this is what we're left with. We're going to upload our brains onto a, uh, this is from, uh, I think it was either from Scientific American or something. You know, and this is the way people talk about it. You know, we're just going to upload our brain and we'll live forever and we'll be a, quite literally a brain in a vat. I mean, that's what this is. Uh, won't that be fun? You know, you, how about if you feel your nose is itchy, you won't be able to scratch it because you're just a computer program or something. I, it's really quite scary. You won't have a nose, but uh, people that, you know, get their arm chopped off from some accident, they still feel as if they have an arm. And if they imagine that they're moving the arm that's no longer there, the brain still activates as if the arm was there. So you know, we're going to be uploaded. That's the goal of the transhumanists and the, and, and the others. And then would it be bad to live forever? I mean, I, it doesn't seem to be in God's design, but I'm not going to. That's for the people over where Father Alberto sits. Somebody who sits on the, 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 the cathedral over there, he'll, he'll tell us whether we should live forever or not. He'll get some direct communication for the man upstairs. So, so these are the, right? I mean, you know, what, what is the purpose of all this? All this stuff that we, we go through. And uh, man would like to make himself in his own image. And that's always the joke, right? That did God create man in his image or did man create God in his image? And um, I gave a talk at a transhumanist conference once, and I think they made a mistake inviting me. I didn't, you know, they heard I was, you know, doing ethics and this kind of stuff, and it didn't work out well. Uh, we had a few disagreements about things. Um, and that's the, the, final, the final analysis of this is we need to be saved from what we are and who we are and how we've been created. And that's the, for me, the, the most concerning thing. And People will get on that bandwagon, even people of faith, you know, and I, I, I actually haven't really thought about that very much, to tell you the truth, uh, sort of the finite nature of our existence, and I just accept it, but I, that's, mine is mostly trying to interface these technologies to try to have the people like Father Alberto, whose who's brother's a neurosurgeon too, but sort of be able to write about it because they know what the science really is. Um, and then this, this is the next thing, um, you know, every, could you imagine everybody's, you know, I mean, we all don't look alike, right? And so our brains are similar, just like, you know, I have a nose, father has a nose, ears, but different. And the brain is the same. Chemistry is a little different. Connections are slightly different. So that, that's the, uh, the hope for the futurists uh, that we're going to be able to do some a magical scan that will be able to map all of that. And then the, the treatments will be designed directly for us, you know, personalized medicine, it's called. And then ultimately, personalized brain stimulation. I'd like to have an IQ of 175, uh, please. And um, I think that's really far off into the future. I'll say one thing about functional imaging, another thing that is done. And people are always fascinated that uh, certain experiments are done and functional MRI or PET scanning is another way <clears throat> you inject a radioactive substance into the blood and it's taken up into the brain. Seems to represent activity of that brain region, but um, PET scanning is a little more quantitative because you can actually see the uptake of the radioactive material. FMRI our statistical analyses and probabilities. So we don't know what that is. We don't know what the physiology is. Uh, it seems to correlate with where things would be, but for higher functions again, 
not just I'm doing this, so this is lighting up on my fMRI, but I'm thinking, I'm, I'm deciding, I'm initiating a thought, I'm recollecting my grandmother's dessert that she used to make, I'm, I'm smelling it, tasting it, seeing her, uh, that's going to be very tough to localize with functional imaging as we now know it. So don't put too much faith in that either. Um, that technology needs to, to grow as well. There's just a couple luminaries in this picture. And uh, the one on the far right is Francis Crick. And um, at the Salk Institute, I spent a lot of time, Rusty Gage, uh, one of the guys that really pushed forward the, the idea of mammalian and the mammalian brain neurogenesis, that there are areas of the brain that are still making new neurons. Because the, the tenet was that uh, you're born with what you got and that's it. Well, there are areas of the brain in the hippocampus, which is, as I said, the memory center of the brain, that makes new neurons. The areas around the, the hollow parts in the middle of the brain make new neurons and your nose area makes new neurons. A lot of people like me often think too, there's this craze about stem cells. Well, if you put stem cells in the liver, maybe they can you know, form part of the liver. But if you're gonna add more variables in, an, in, in, a, in a structure that is highly, highly ordered, like the hippocampus, and you're gonna put stem cells in the hippocampus, that creates disorder. Who wants that? So guess what? Neurogenesis, after all the money and all the, the almost Nobel Prize, the only thing that improves the, uh, the formation of neurogenesis to mature neurons in the mammalian brain, the only thing that's been proven is exercise. We did a study with monkeys, cognitive enhancement only, didn't do anything in the neurogenesis. So if you exercise, you have more new neurons in your hippocampus, but the question is, what are they doing? You know, it's probably the oxygen and stuff like that. So they, it wasn't prompted by thinking, it was prompted by exercise. So they probably don't really belong up there to create disorder. Is that it? I, that's it, I can talk forever, so I should stop. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, I guess there's, uh, there was also Patricia Smith Church in there, right? Yes, oh, oh I should have yeah, introduced. So Crick was there and the greatest living neurosurgeon who your brother would know was there, Yasher Gill. He was, uh, he was my guest uh, at the University of California, San Diego. I was there on the faculty before I came here to Texas. And then uh, Churchland was behind and she's, uh, she was the chairperson of the Department of Philosophy, UCSD. And then the chairman of psychiatry was there and the chairman of neurosurgery. And the chairman of psychiatry just come back from the NIH where he was the... Uh, director of NIMH. So we all, uh, when Dr. Yashergill, who's the greatest living nursery who's still alive, came to town, um, uh, I asked him if he'd like to meet Francis Crick. And he said, of course. And he was like a little boy. Neurosurgeons aren't historically considered to be nice, easygoing people. Um, I'm unique. I'm so nice and wonderful. But most neurosurgeons are not. They're very tough. And the Dr. Yashergill sort of melted. He was like a little boy around the great Francis Crick. He brought all kinds of books he wanted Francis Crick to sign. And it was actually very refreshing to see him vulnerable uh, around Crick, who was a great, Crick was a great guy. I mean, he was a, he's an atheist and all kinds of stuff, but he was, I had lunch. I was allowed by both chairs, psychiatry first and the neurosurgery next, to have lunch every Thursday at Francis Crick's lunch table at the faculty club, uh, which was a great honor because it was all these luminaries from the world uh, would be sitting at his table and me, and he would kind of call me Professor Buchanan. I thought I think he was being cute, but he said, "Could you get an electrode there, Professor Buchanan?" Um, and it was uh, it was a great experience, you know, because he got into consciousness. If you win the Nobel Prize, and so you always have to go to consciousness. There's nothing else. So Gerald Edelman was another person who was at lunch with us a lot. Um, all those guys from the what's called the Neuroscience Institute in La Jolla as well. So it was a great training ground. Amazing to think about these things. I, I was wondering 
because in your talk, great, great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. You open a, a lot. I, I, I write down a lot of notes here. Good. <laughs> um, um, you talk also about the, the, um, the point of ed education and the point to be aware of the development of our brain during our lifestyle, especially, for example, the so-called uh, neuro, neuro vulnerable people, such as adolescents, kids, etc. They are in their neurodevelopmental um, brain activity. I don't know if you are familiar or you, you, you have no um, analyze Alma Pontius. Uh, she was a great uh, neuropsychologist psychiatrist in uh, first in New York um, Faculty of Medicine and at the end of her life in uh, Harvard University and she she was born in 1921 so uh, this year we are um, in uh, her 100 uh, anniversary mm. and um, she uh, was she was the first that Uh, coined the term neuroethics in 1973 uh, because uh, she realized that uh, different praxis coming from behaviorism uh, were, were not uh, aware of the neurodevelopment of in this, in this, in this context of the um, walking of the newborn. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, so I don't know if you uh, know if you knew no, not, Analyza Alma Pontius. I can't believe I'm not familiar with her. Okay, I'm embarrassed. No, 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 no. It's uh, like uh, <laughs> uh, she she coined the term neuroethics. So I I I want to ask you if you can um, give your uh, gave us your blessing. Um, view about the neurodevelopment and nowadays in the context of um, different type of pseudo enhancement, cognitive enhancement, they are used, especially in college, the use of Rintelin, the use of uh, Adderall, etc. So uh, in my perspective, there's a, a type of uh, massive experimentation without any control. So what do you think about this and from the neurosurgery perspective, but also from the psychiatric perspective, we are in a society who, in which our, our college students are abused without being uh, diagnosed with psychiatric disorder. They are taking psychiatric drugs. Well, <clears throat> you know, the definition of Ritalin and Provigil and medicines like that or drugs like that as psychiatric drugs uh, is kind of on the back end, right? These are, dr these are drugs which function to cause release of certain neurotransmitters. Uh, they, they slow down the reuptake of certain transmitters neurotransmitters, especially dopamine. And uh, so it, what can they be used for, you know, in medicine? Well, there's not a lot of call for flooding your system with dopamine. Uh, it does exactly what an amphetamine does. It uh, has physiological effects, your heart races, all these things. But it also is like a, uh, is like a uh, lighthouse. You know, you're able to focus, super focus on things but not forever. And what happens is it, it depletes, it depletes the stores of dopamine because they get released uh, in big quantities. And then the body, the brain has to, the, the, neuro, the nerve cell itself that make dopamine has to remake it, has to reproduce it. So <clears throat> I think that there's both psychological and physiological dependencies on these medications then. I'm just going to call them drugs. Uh, so the student 
uh, will get to the point that she or he will feel that they can't study without the drug. Now, uh, as I said, you know, Father, you would get another PhD. Uh, I would be able to stay up all night, uh, you know, looking at my screen, picking out the spikes that I need to answer my questions. I could do that if I took that medicine. But uh, my next day, I'd be exhausted. I'd, I'd have to go to sleep. I'd have to, you know. So that's what happens. It, it causes a depletion. It alters normal physiology of the dopaminergic system for uh, a non-medical reason. And I'll give you another example. So my, as I said, my son has never played a video game in his life. He, uh, he's written a couple books that are published. He writes under the, 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 the name S.T. Shaw because he won't, the first book he published was when he was nine. He uh, has already taken calculus as an eighth grader and he's passed the calculus exam that people take when they're seniors in high school. And he's never done anything. And he fought with people. He went to a special, high sc a special school for the highly gifted, but I think he's right. He used to fight with his classmates saying that your creativity is being not squashed, quashed, that he, he actually corrected one of the teachers who was a PhD in his school. He said it's quashed. It's not squashed. Because, the, well, they, they would say, no, there's tremendous creativity when you, watch, when you play a video game. Or you, and my son rightly said, it's external. It's not internal. So if you're watching a movie, you're playing a video game about the great Tolkien trilogy, you know, Lord of the Rings, you are told what the orc looks like, what Sauron looks like, what the, you know, Frodo looks like. But when you read it, you create, you create this mental phantasm of, of what these people look like. It's a completely different process. So we're, I'm worried that we're going to have a generation of people uh, that are going to have a paucity of creativity and being able to, to conjure up things from within because they've always been so reliant on novelty from without. You can have novelty from inside your head. The great thinkers, you know, people have come up with amazing, amazing discoveries. The guy that came up with the benzene ring had a dream one night that a snake bit its own tail and it was like a, the benzene ring. And that was uh, pivotal to understanding organic chemistry. You know, if he was watching, you know, something, uh, playing some crazy, I, who knows if he would have that kind of vivid dream. So I think that that's the, the problem with taking these, these things is there's a psychological effect that you, you have, you're reliant on it. I can't do it without it. And you're unable to muster an internal resolve Right? People are successful because they, there's something within them that they learn and families and communities nurture them, where they, they, they drive things from within and not relying on things from without you know, their, their system. And I mean, that's, that's the essence. That's, the, that's actually the essence of Christian, of, of Christian thought, too. I mean, God is here and he's made us, but we're not, you know, we're not a puppet, you know, and so we, 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 we grace is showered on us, uh, but God is not really pulling any strings. We are driving our lives from within, and uh, I think relying on external forces uh, or physiological and, and other is, is, is going to be the undoing. I'm very worried about the next generation. I'm worried about getting sick. Um, a new generation of doctors, too, kind of are being trained in a different way. I, I worked 130 hour weeks as a neurosurgery resident. Didn't really, I never made a mistake. I was awake. Patient, patient, pa surgery, surgery, you know, and so I knew what to do. It wasn't like a part time job. You know, it's like, I'm going to read this textbook and then I'll see a patient. It was see all those patients. And then you went home and read the textbook. No, no, I, I just, uh, we shouldn't get too soft. Um, life is tough. And uh, talk about a, an example of how life is tough. Look at Christ himself, right? 
it's crucified. Anything short of crucifixion, I'm okay with, for me. <laughs> Bob, there's um, some question here from Facebook, our, our researcher. Well, the first one is uh, deal with the transcranial man magnetic stimulation and addiction. They're mm -hmm. asking about um, um, their study dealing with addiction and uh, the application of TMS. Mm. I don't, that is out of my field, addiction. Okay. Um, right now, the only thing that gets stimulated <coughs> uh, with transcranial magnetic stimulation for clinical purposes is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. You know, so that's the answer to everything. You know? So, um, you know, addiction, it would, it would be reliant on the same areas that show activation with PET scanning or fMRI. A lot of those areas are in the, uh, they're kind of in the orbital frontal area. They're in the deep areas of the cingulate cortex, which is kind of in the, on the inside of the brain, hard to get to, but now we have deep TMS, they can get there. Um, but I think that TMS can either stimulate neuronal firing or slow down neuronal firing. So I think it's a great tool, uh, converting magnetism to electricity. So you, um, you can inhibit. Yeah, you can inhibit. Yeah, because okay. what you do is you send a slow frequency Okay. Uh, magnetic uh, wave first, it's converted to electrical stimulus, but it's slow wave. What, what happens is, is the nervous system can't help. It likes to congregate, you know? And so if the wave is moving slow and they're getting all this information about go slow, the neurons start going slow. So if you have an area that is showing decreased activity by functional MRI, you can speed it up. Uh, with TMS. And the converse is true too. And we thought about doing this with autism. There are areas in the posterior temporal region. I, I hope somebody's on the line and can finally do this research because I can't get it done. I got too much to do. But this relatedness, you know, a, a many, most patients with autism, even mild autism, have a hard time with like theory of the mind. They don't really quite get your, the, you know, your mind and and so they have a, a decrease, sort of a hypoactivity. I can't remember if it's right or left of the temporal parietal region. We had designed a study where we we're going to do TMS to try to give it some juice, try to get it uh, sparked to see then if they could, there's something about that area where they could then uh, have some relatedness to the other. Um, we never got it done. The kid I was doing it with, left to become a faculty member at NYU. I think he's doing okay. The other, uh, because we, in 2017, we deal uh, with the so-called um, head transplant, body oh. to head transplant. <laughs> oh. So someone oh. asked, as for you, as both a neurosurgery and a psychiatrist, Oh. Could you tell us your opinion on the so-called head transplant? Because we, we just published uh, a book <laughs> with our analysis. So I guess- Is that the book I bought? Your book, that latest book? The little book. Head no, transplant no, no, no. in there? There are another book um, come, uh, come out in Italian, but we are translating in English and in Spanish also. Well, yeah, I can read Spanish. So, um, so that was so uh, the work of Robert White, right? Yeah, Catholic, Robert White. A and Catholic. Sergio Canavero. Yeah, Robert White. Robert White was member of the Pontifical Academy for Sciences. Right. How about that? How about <laughs> that? And I listen. I knew him very well. I was very young, you know, uh, sort of in training when I sort of interacted with him, and then he kind of disappeared a bit. But yeah, he was the guy. That was uh, uh, not necessarily head trend. What he would do is he'd cut, I mean, this is a terrible thing to do to a primate. Primates are very smart. I don't think they're, I don't think they quite get it. They're not sentient, almost. He cut their head off and he would perfuse or in, pump in fluids to the artery that goes to the brain and collect the fluid that came back 
and the poor little the monkey head, which was de decapitated from the body, would be sitting there looking around. And then he'd give it a straw to have some water and it would take the straw like it always had. It brings back, it conjures up the French Revolution, you know, when you had your head cut off, that's the question. How long are you conscious for if your head is rolling around in the basket? Are you looking around thinking, oh boy, I guess this is the end. Um, somebody glue my head back on. So, well, of course, I mean, you separate the brain. I am a, a neurolog, I believe in neurological criteria for death. That was another thing that uh, I, I believe firmly in. So I think if your brain uh, is disconnected from your body, uh, either by being going to the guillotine or it is no longer functional, then I think the, the person is gone. I think the person is dead. Um, and I don't encourage uh, head transplant operations because, I mean, I guess I would want to be on you know, some NBA basketball star's body. Um, <laughs> and nobody's going to want my body. It's so broken down. You know, I mean, I, I would be a head with no home. So I don't know where I would go. Well, who's doing uh, trend, head transplant research? Well, uh, he's uh, an Italian neurosurgery that moved from Italy to China. Uh, yeah. Italy, and uh, Sergio Canavero. Sergio oh. Canavero. I, I, I met him in Milan. Uh, we had a great conversation. It's very, oh my gosh. very funny. Uh, yeah, but what, so, what does he uh, think he's doing? I don't know. What does he think he's doing? I don't even uh, know what is, the purpose is. Pushing the, he, he wants to to be the first in history to perform the first human head or body to head transplant because technically it's body to head, head transplant um, but there's no way of connecting the nervous system for one thing yeah, yeah. I mean, you need you need a supercomputer working day and night just to connect the brain stem to the spinal cord it would be impossible i mean he should probably just try to do what i do in my spare time either doing research or i'm out uh, in a van with a Catholic organization dressing the feet of street people who have wounds. You know, I'm not trying to cut some head off and attach it. It's, it seems like he's very uh, misguided. Yeah. yeah the last, la last question, because time is flowing. Uh, the future that you portrayed, um, the real future, if we can say, in what do you expect in five, 10 years from now, the development of neurotechnology applied to the brain or to the nervous system? What do I you think, think that there's going to be uh, first uh, breakthroughs that are going to come through are going to be more gene, gene based. So, genetic engineering now with CRISPR, they're going to be able to, and that may be the first thing. There may be, they may be able to cover, uncover a few of the genes that are related in the memory sequence. Uh, and they may try to, they may try to uh, insert those into the, into the genome, not the germ cell layer, which we inherit, but just the, the person themselves potentially. Um, I think we're a long way away and I'm, I'm hoping, and, and actually uh, isn't just I'm praying that we go slow. Um, one of my colleagues here in the United States, uh, Eddie Chang, as a, as a neurosurgeon, uh, published a paper, I think it was in Nature, uh, where they were able to take uh, neuronal signals that the person was thinking who was without language, and the computer was able to uh, take these neuronal signals and kind of put them together to talk. That's the first time that was done. That paper just came out a month or a month and a half ago. So, you know, that's, you know, moving in, a, in this direction as well. Um, you know, I think uh, for enhancement, uh, I think hopefully it'll be a while. But stuff like that, uh, you know, the retina, artificial retina, uh, maybe somebody who can't speak, Chang technology from UC San Francisco. That kind of stuff makes sense to me. Um, trying to replace something that's missing if it's safe. But I think hopefully we're a long way away from 
like we climbed the top of Mount Everest to put your flag in. I think we're a long way away from putting our flag in the human brain. Uh, we haven't even figured out the brain. The brain we also found recently communicates through vibration, actual physical vibrations, not just chemistry. So we're, you know, we, we don't know. And then the mind, where, where is that thing sitting? Where is this energy coming from that sparks the thought? How does that happen? There's, we think in cause and effect with our finite brains, but uh, if somebody can answer the spark of life, where that spark of life? I think I know where it comes from. It comes from on high, but where does the spark of life come from? Hopefully enhancement is a long way off. I'll be dead. I'll be struggling <laughs> in purgatory. I know I'm going to purgatory. It's going to be a while, <laughs> but I just won't suffer. I just won't see God. No. Okay. Thank you very much to Professor Robert Buchanan for this great talk and this um, a lot of things to reflect on it. Yeah, if anybody wants to come over and do a fellowship in the lab, in if you Texas. Work hard, yeah, you have to share the Nobel Prize with me though, 50-50. Okay. Even 50 -50. though I never talked to you in the two years. Of <laughs> okay. Well, thank okay. you for inviting me, Father. Alberto. Thank you. Thank you. And we, so thank you very much. Oh, my so, pleasure. Thank you. And uh, I greeting all the people connected through the, our platform here from uh, uh, Zoom. We forget to Facebook and YouTube. So we are connected to our research members and also to our students. And thank you very much for this um going deeper and deeper to the neuro neurotech strategy and technologies and next month uh we are connecting uh, we are um we we present to you our research laboratory here in the uh, university of rome so in november uh, uh we are going to connect uh, from our uh, neuroscience lab here for Bob. We use um, um, I say medical, it. no, just uh, uh, to show um, our research here dealing with uh, um, um, trans um, EEG, so electroencephalography, and dealing with, with uh, also the so called. EEG and the uh, neuroscience of sociality. So, Tough. see you yeah. next month. <laughs> bye and God bless. Tutte finito. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.